the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have invited new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Winston Peel and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This video is called The Jesuits Today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, today and tomorrow. The Jesuits are very interesting to follow. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna rhyme. <laughs> that was an accident. But... Um, you know, the history of the Jesuits, and we are going a little bit into this here because Voltaire said something interesting about that. We are going to uh, uh, to see a little bit of the history of the Jesuits in this um, chapter. The Jesuits today, which is chapter 12 of All Roads Lead to Rome. And uh, I, I, I can't wait. And uh, I, I shouldn't waste any time anyway because it's on w page 127 and it goes all the way up to page 139. So that's about 12 pages to read. <laughs> so I shouldn't waste so much time in the beginning to make it uh, try to fit into an hour, you know, because the point is um, the attention span, of course, it is otherwise uh, set to big, to bigger proof. <laughs> <laughs> and um okay let's let's just go there the jesuits today from all roads lead to rome from michael de Semyon. starting to read on page 127 if you follow along in your own copy of the book a vigilant christian organization crib which stands for catholic research information bureau sounded a strong and sober warning note quote don't be deceived the roman church is like a chameleon tolerant, friendly, highly moral and authoritative in Protestant England and America. But where there is a Rom Roman Catholic majority, she is very different and no friend of freedom, always blending in with the landscape, but never quite what she seems to be." Unquote. But where there is a Roman Catholic majority, she's very different. Yeah. Just take a look at the history of very Roman Catholic countries in Europe, like Spain, like Italy. Look at Latin America. There are so many things I could comment on that I don't even start here. But just think about that. The Roman Catholic Church is the one responsible for the freedom of religion in the Constitution of the United States of America, because that gave freedom of religion to Catholics who were not allowed 
to follow their superstitious and idolatrous religion in the colonies. But from the founding of 1776 of the United States of America on, all of a sudden, they were allowed. H. G. Wells observed in his book Crux Ansata that, quote, Roman Catholicism presents many faces to the world, but everywhere it is systematic in its fight against freedom, unquote. Yeah, the only freedom the Roman Catholic Church teaches is the freedom to be Catholic. <laughs> you understood that? The freedom to be Catholic means when you're not Catholic, you won't have their freedom. That's the point. Okay, well, I, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Come on, just continue reading, York. The Jesuits who originally implemented the Counter-Reformation by decree of the Council of Trent are seen as continuing to do so in the present century with increasing success. Once counselors to kings, such as James II and Louis XIV, who held divine rights, the Jesuits very often masterminded the dramatic events of history by scheming and prompting backstage. Now they are making their comeback in positions of influence among our institutions. Many of them have been able to come out in the open since the current climate of spiritual indifference. They have little to hide. However, placed in key positions in religious broadcasting, in educational establishments, including Britain's top schools, even in evangelistic undertakings, they have been reinstated in a way that just decades ago would have seemed unthinkable. At the head of the Society of Jesus is the su Superior General, the supreme ruler over the Jesuits, often called the Black Pope. The full extent of his power and influence over the papacy can be known to very few, but it is more than possible that often it exceeds that of the Pope himself. In my humble opinion, the black pope has more power than the white pope even since the time before 1773. And if you want to understand that why, I ask you to go to my reading of Rulers of Evil and you will understand when you read the chapters concerning Lorenzo Ricci and the time of the suppression of the Jesuits. I'm not going into that here, but I'm going into that right there and you can have a look for yourself. Notorious in the past, expelled from every country in Europe and banned from residence in England until 1902, the Jesuits have often been described as the secret army of the papacy. Yes, they were founded as Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, a papal bull, which means in English the Church at War. The preface to Edmond Paris's book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, includes a warning to the Church which has been sounded many times in relation to the threat posed by the Counter-Reformation. Quote, The Order of the Society of Jesus was founded by Ignatius Loyola to secretly accomplish two major goals for the Roman Catholic institution. The first was to obtain universal political power, the second, to establish the universal church. What's another word for universal? Catholic. Huh? The Reformation had seriously damaged the Roman system, the quote goes on. The way forward, apart from the Inquisition, was by infiltration and penetration into every section of life with the aim of enforcing the canons and doctrines and temporal power of the Pope. To that end, Jesuits went to work, secretly infiltrating all Protestant groups, including families, places of work, hospitals, schools, colleges, etc. Today, the Jesuits have almost completed that mission. The Bible must lo puts local church government into the hands of a godly pastor. But the effect of Jesuit activity over the years has been to remove that power to the de denominational headquarters to temporalize the church and thus to push Protestant denominations into the arms of the Vatican. Unquote. From the Secret History of the Jesuits from author Edmond Paris. From Jude 4 we read, quote, 
for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Unquote. Reverend James Aitken Wiley, in his monumental work History of Protestantism, described the Jesuits thus, quote, There was no tongue they could not speak, and no creed they could not profess, and thus there was no people among whom they might not sojourn, and no church whose membership they, might no, they may not enter, and whose functions they might not discharge. They could execrate the Pope with the Lutheran and swear the solemn league with the Covenanter. The order of Jesus is never more formidable than when it appears to be least so. It is when Jesuits are stripped of all external means of doing harm that they devise the vastest schemes and execute them with the most daring courage." Unquote. Now again, in the History of the Jesuits, published in 1897, another quote from A. Nicolini revealed the four open classes of Jesuits and the fifth secret class who, quote, by the confession of Father Pellini, constitute the strength and power of the society. Nor does the agent of Rome, and above all, the Jesuit, expound at once the whole system of his religion, such as it is, but, with diabolical dexterity, he first insinuates himself into the confidence of the man he has marked as a proselyte, captivates his benevolence by all sorts of arts, and then, step by step, he leads him as a convert into the fold of the modern Babylon." Unquote. In 1551, secret instructions sent from the Council of Trent to the Jesuits in Paris were intercepted on the person of Thomas Heath, who was a Jesuit professing the highest style of Puritanism. These instructions set forth the most effective way of undermining and destroying the Church of England. Quote, Ye are not to preach all after one method, but observe the place wherein you come. If Lutherism is prevalent, then preach Calvinism. If Calvinism, then Lutherism. If in England, then neither of them, or uh, then either of them, or John Huss's opinions, Anabaptism, or any that are contrary to the Holy See or of St. Peter, by which your function will not be suspected, and yet you may still act on the interest of Mother Church. There being, as the Council are agreed on, no better way to demolish that Church, the Church of England, of heresy, but by mixture of doctrines, and by adding of ceremonies more than at present permitted." Unquote. From Albert Close's book, Rome's Fight for the British Throne. Now, I have to make one little comment here. There was this meeting with Kenneth Copeland, with the Pope via the iPhone, and Tony Palmer was in there. I guess you all know the video. If you don't, then look it up. And there he mentioned, quite rightly, that the Protestant Church is so much divided, because today we have more than 30,000 different denominations. Yes, that's true. The Protestant world is divided into more than 30,000 denominations. And here I have just read to you why. Because it says, There being as the Council are agreed, no, uh, uh, as the Council agreed on, no better way to demolish that Church, standing here for the Church of England, meaning the Protestant Church of heresy, but by mixture of doctrines and by adding of ceremonies more than at present permitted. I just told you how the Protestants got divided. By making compromises, by mixtures of doctrines. And a real Protestant adheres to 
sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. And when you adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone, you don't put mixtures of doctrine in there. The doctrine of the Bible, the Word of God, tells you how to worship and who to worship and nothing else. But it is because people let go of their principles. That's how Protestantism got divided. And the Bible says of this last satanic antichrist system that a house divided in itself cannot stand. Well, that goes for the Antichrist system, but that also goes for the Protestantism system. Let me call it that way. When we take all these denominational churches and call them another system. Divided in themselves. They cannot stand. Only united you can stand. United with Jesus Christ. The one and only. The Savior of the world. The Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, who died for you at the cross. With Him united, you can stand, and otherwise we can't. Division is that what killed the Protestant movement, and the Jesuits knew it, and were working for that all the way, because they were only established to extirpate the Protestant movement. Well, the author continues, According to the French writer Adolphe Michel, Voltaire estimated the number of books written about the Jesuits over the years to be around 6,000 at the end of the 18th century. Now, please, go out there to the internet, to your local library, and try to find even one-tenth of these 6,000 books that Voltaire spoke about here. In the 19th century, books and sermons countering the Jesuits and their activities were published in profusion. Nowadays, they are few and far between. It seems that innumerable such works have gone out of print and disappeared from the bookshelves. Oh, why would that be when we leave the Jesuit ruling our education system, when we leave the Roman Catholic Church organizing schools, libraries, the press, and all that stuff. In theological colleges and public libraries it is now hard to find any history of the Jesuits beyond the beginning of the 17th century. Most books on the Counter-Reformation are written by Roman Catholics, many by the Jesuits themselves. Well, most books on the Counter-Reformation, yeah. Think of, for example, Malachi Martin, who was a Jesuit, who wrote The Keys of This Blood. Um, think of Avro Manhattan, who was a Knight of Malta, who wrote many interesting books on the Counter-Reformation. Given that the Society of Jesus today, possibly more than ever, is the leading wing of the Roman Catholic Church, all of this needs explanation and attention. Protestant watchmen believe that the Jesuits have accomplished a remarkable feat in a relatively short time span in ridding schools, universities and theological colleges of almost all historical literature written from a Protestant viewpoint indoctrination and obedience. Education is the key to Jesuitism itself. Another quote from Nicolini. Quote, the most striking characteristic of Jesuit education, as we have already frequently remarked, was, and still is, that almost all the persons educated in their colleges consider themselves in a certain way attached to the order, and to the end of their lives work to their utmost for its aggrandizement. And this art of binding to their society all their disciples makes the Jesuits powerful and dangerous, especially in those countries where they are adverse to the government or to a class of citizens. We insist on this consideration. 
Unquote. Examples of this binding or indoctrination are readily to be found in the spiritual exercises of founder Ignatius Loyola. And let me remind you, the spiritual exercises is nothing else than a fancy word for brainwashing. In Rules of Thinking with the Church, the instruction is, quote, always to be ready to obey with mind and heart, setting aside all judgment of one's own. The true spouse of Christ, our Holy Mother, our infallible and orthodox mistress, the Catholic Church whose authority is exercised over us by the hierarchy. Another principle laid down by Yolola may cause the reader to gasp. Quote, that we may be all together of the same mind and in conformity with the Church herself, if she shall have defined anything to be black, which to our eyes appears to be white, we ought, in like manner, to pronounce it to be black. Unquote. The total obedience, perende ac cadaver, means... In German we have a nice word for that, Kaldavergehorsam, means obedience as a cadaver. The total obedience required from those who accept the Constitution and swear the Jesuit oath is such that, quote, they must allow themselves to be born and ruled by divine providence, working through their superiors exactly as if they were a corpse which suffers itself to be born and handled in any way whatsoever, or just an old man's stick which serves him, who holds it in his hands wherever and whatever purpose he wish to use it. Unquote. From Documents of the Christian Church, pages 361 to 363. Such training and discipline and total submission to the order, allied to ruthless single-mindedness, have brought worldly dividends in the exercise of absolute power in this century as well as in the last, speaking of the 20th and the 19th century. Abraham Lincoln and the Jesuits. There is an interesting connection for the ones of you who don't know that yet. Former Roman Catholic priest Charles Chenequi who during the 1860s led almost all the Catholic population of St. Anne in Illinois to trust in Christ alone, was a friend and confidant of President Abraham Lincoln. In his book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome, he describes his last meeting with Lincoln before the assassination. The president spoke of his present, uh, of his, uh, present time and that God called uh, that God, quote, will call me to him through the hand of an assassin, unquote, and expressed his feelings and revealed a very deep faith. Quote, I see the storm coming and I know that his hand is in it. I believe I am ready. I am nothing, but truth is everything. I know that I am right because I know that liberty is right. For Christ teaches us teaches it, and Christ is God." Unquote. He spoke of his impending death. Following news he had just received of the letter of Pope Pius IX to Jefferson Davis in support of the South's cause in the Civil War. He knew that the publication of this letter was his death warrant. Quote, so many plots have been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have all failed. When we consider that the great majority of them were in the hands of the skillful Roman Catholic murderers, evidently trained by Jesuits. The Jesuits are so expert in those deeds of blood that Henry IV said that it is impossible to escape them and he became their victim. Though he did all that, he <coughs> though he did all that could be done to protect himself. My escape from their hands since the letter of the Pope to Jeff Davis has sharpened a million of daggers to pierce my breast, would be more than a miracle. But just as the Lord ha heard no murmur from the lips of Moses when he told him that he had to die before crossing the Jordan for the sins of his people, so I hope and pray that he will hear no murmur from me when I fall for my nation's sake." Unquote. 
President Lincoln was assassinated in Washington on the 14th of April, 1865. Brigadier General Thomas Harris, a member of the military commission that tried and condemned the conspirators found guilty of the crime, was convinced of the complicity of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the assassination and its responsibility for it. He wrote that there was, quote, positive evidence that the Jesuit fathers engaged in preparing young men for the priesthood away out of the village of St. Joseph in far off Minnesota were in correspondence with their brethren in Washington City and had been informed that the plan to assassinate the president had been matured. The agents for its accomplishment had <coughs> been found. The time for its execution had been set. And so sure were they of, this, of its accomplishment that they could announce it as already done, three or four hours, three or four hours before it had been consummated. Unquote. Brigadier Thomas General Harris, in his book *Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln*, a book I advise everybody to read. And there is another book also on the assassination of Lincoln, if you want to read that. And that's a book um, from Burke McCarthy. And it is called The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, you can still get that online, I think, at, um, at Amazon. I'm just having op opened the site here, you can buy that. And maybe it's even available online. I didn't find it as a PDF, otherwise I would probably have it. But that book that I just mentioned and the book from um, General Thomas Harris, Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and the book 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinnikri. I can absolutely advise you from the bottom of my heart to read these books to understand real American history and the influence of the Jesuits therein. Now, we go to the next little part here, and that is called The Nazis and the Catholic Hierarchy. Hitler and Himmler were greatly influenced by the Jesuits, as was Mussolini, whose father confessor was a Jesuit. Dr. J. H. Lehman points out, um, that's not J. H. Lehman, that's a typo, that is uh, L. H. Lehman, Leo Herbert Lehman, points out in his book Behind the Dictators that the Jesuit father Stempfle wrote Mein Kampf for Hitler. By the way, I read and discussed the whole book Behind the Dictators on my channel. You can find that in the playlist of the same name. I did that, uh, that was the book that I finished just before publishing this one. The ghost writing of Stempfle argues in Mein Kampf in favor of the, the indisputability of the Catholic dogmas and of the intolerant attitude of Catholic education, as well as the necessity of blind faith and of the personal infallibility of the Pope. Unquote from the book. That was, by the way, written in 1942. It's out of print, but you can get the online PDF version. Edmond Paris relates in The Vatican Against Europe that Hitler's associate Hermann Rauschning called Hitler, uh, recalls Hitler as saying that he learned most of all from the Jesuit order. Quote, so far there has been nothing more imposing on earth than the hierarchical organization of the Roman Catholic Church. A good part of that organization I have transported to my own party, the NSDAP. I will tell you a secret. I am founding an order. End quote. From Hitler Madi, from Rauschnick, 1939, published. Hitler Madi, that's French, and that stands for Hitler told me. Hitler was also quoted as saying of Heinrich Himmler, quote, In Himmler I see our Ignatius de Loyola. Unquote. Walter Schellenberg, like Joseph Goebbels, also Jesuit educated, who led the SD or Sicherheitsdienst, Security Dienst, the security service of the SS, and was sent sentenced to death at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity, stated that, quote, The SS organization has been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Their regulations and their spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly." Unquote. Now, 
there's a little footnote here that I read uh, that I read over because that is mentioned um, when we go to Hitler Madi from Rauschnick um, and it says for two years he meaning Hitler attended classes at the Benedictine monastery at Lambach where he sang in the choir on page 24 on the rise and fall of the Third Reich by William Shira. Well, that is absolutely right and uh, Lambach, um, Hitler was there and there are even uh, pictures of that in that time. Hitler, Hitler was a Catholic all his life. Don't believe all the trolls out there who want to tell you something else. Do your own research and you will see that in numerous quotes and um, books mentioned that Hitler was a Catholic from the beginning to the end. And even the Spanish dictator Franco published an obituary on the day Hitler so-called died in 1945, calling him a Catholic fighting for the Mother Church. And this is an official document that you can look up for yourself. So Hitler was a Catholic all the way through. Himmler, whose uncle, the Jesuit father Himmler, yeah, well, I'm going to look up his name here in a second, yeah, because that is someone that you probably have never heard about, um, except for when you followed my reading behind the dictators, because there I'm expressly speaking about him, Josef Gebhard Himmler. Yeah? That is the uncle of Heinrich Himmler, he was a Jesuit father, and he was the very eye and arm of Halke Ledokowski, general of this order, the Black Pope at the time of the Third Reich. According to author Edmond Paris, quote, belonged to a family that was entirely devoted to the Church. His position as supreme chief of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits general and the whole structure was a close imitation of the Catholic Church's hierarchical order. Unquote. From the book The Vatican Against Europe from Edmond Paris, printed in 1961. The Nazi party was brought to power through the acquisitions uh, of the Catholic Central Party in Germany and the higher strategy of the Vatican. Instrumental in this strategy were Reichschancellor Franz von Papen, who was a knight of Malta, and papal nuncio Monsignore Eugenio Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII, Hitler's Pope. Papal Nuncio Monsignor Pacelli was Nuncio in Germany from 1917 to 1929. And after that, he had a very high post in the Vatican. Behind the Dictators. Go to that book or my reading of it. A lot of that, what stands here, is in there. Von Papen, Knight of Malta, owner of the Central Party's official paper Germania, played a leading part in obtaining Hitler <coughs> his two-thirds majority, signed the law which made Hitler head of state and also was responsible for the enormously important concordat with the Pope in Rome in July 1933, four months after Hitler coming to power. Franz von Papen signed with Eugenio Pacelli working in the Vatican at that time, the Concordat between the Third Reich, Germany, and the Vatican. That Concordat is still in working today. The Concordat was his most remarkable achievement and the culmination of his close working with Pacelli and the Vatican. Von Papen declared, quote, the Third Reich is the first power in the world not only to recognize, but to put into practice the lofty principles of the papacy. Unquote. Do I need to read that again? That is what Knight of Malta, second in command in Germany and one of the rulers behind Adolf Hitler, said officially. 
The Third Reich is the first power in the world not only to recognize, but to put into practice the lofty principles of the papacy. Franz von Papen could have been Chancellor, but he put the puppet Hitler in front and stayed in the back, exactly as the same thing that George Herbert Bush, George, yeah, you know, the Bush from the 90s there, the father of uh, W. Bush, um, did when, for example, Reagan was president. He stayed in the back. The same when Clinton was president. He stayed in the back. Yeah, you don't believe that? Do your own research. The Bushes reigned from the early 80s on until the mid-2000s, until George W. Bush went away. You had a family dynasty there of almost 30 years. But back to the book. Eugenio Pacelli as Pius XII became notorious for his silence with regard to Nazi atrocities and von Papen for his success in avoiding responsibility for them. Pius XII is high up on the present Pope's shortlist for canonization and von Papen, who incredibly was acquitted at Nuremberg, was later appointed Papal Chamberlain to Pope John XXIII. The exercise of power, the apparatus of Catholic action. In his book Memorial of the Captivity of Napoleon at St. Helena, in Volume 2, French General Montolon gave his description of the Society of Jesus. And this is a quote that is often attributed to Napoleon himself as having been read in his um, memoirs. Quote, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. Unquote. Universal power? What is another word for universal? Many Protestant watchmen see the Jesuits as just as powerful and active as ever today. Writing in 1965, Knight of Malta, Avro Manhattan, an authority on Roman Catholicism in politics, described them as, quote, the ecclesiastical stormtroopers of the Catholic Church, unquote, and remarked that, quote, it is most significant that in two traditionally English-speaking Protestant countries, Great Britain and the United States of America, they have their largest contingents, unquote from the book Vatican Imperialism in the 20th Century. Jesuits occupy posts at the highest levels of influence in government, although they are not easily identified. One example, Vernon Walters was a roving ambassador for successive United States administrations and top-level negotiator for the White House for many years. In Washington he has steered a careful path, avoiding calls to power and concentrating on serving men at the very top. He was educated at Stonyhurst College and, a French, uh, and at French Jesuit schools and was described by former Secretary of State Alexander Haig as, quote, like a member of the clergy in terms of his lifestyle, unquote. Vernon Walter's most recent assignment has been as ambassador to Germany, leading up to reunification and beyond. Doesn't that tell you something? Who was behind the fall of the Berlin Wall? Who was behind Glasnost, Perestroika and the fall of the Soviet Union? Yeah, just think, just read, just study real history. And never forget to take the Bible all along. Influence in the Church 
Another former pupil of top Jesuit school, Stonyhurst College, is leading English charismatic Charles Whitehead. In his testimony that he gives on the FGBMFI circuit, he has revealed and affirmed his Jesuit background. He is married to an Anglican and heads the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Organization in Britain and also for Northern Europe, for which he regularly reports to the Vatican. His parachurch activities, especially his role as president of the FGBMFI chapter, have greatly influenced many Protestant leaders, who have been led in an ecumenical direction by him. Apparentists on television in 1991 point the way to his arrival on the national stage as Catholic, le as Catholic lay leader in the charismatic church as it emerges as a serious force under George Carey's ecumenical leadership. David Alton, whose battle against abortion in Parliament has won him great influence among evangelicals, was baptized by Franciscan monks and educated by the Sisters of Mercy and the Jesuits. According to Sunday Times writer Elizabeth Grice, Alton mocks the suggestion that he is member of the Roman Catholic Mafia, taking his orders from Rome. He describes himself as an ecumenical Christian and, like Charles Whitehead, is married to an Anglican. And although he worships mainly at Liverpool's Roman Catholic Cathedral, he also attends a Church of England church in Edge Hill. Quote, Many of the people who attended the rally which launched the new movement of Christian democracy in London in November 1990 were pro-lifers who had made contact with David Alton's office during the abortion amendment campaign. Unquote. According to the Catholic newspaper The Universe, founded by Mr. Alton and his Roman Catholic fellow, Member of Parliament, Ken Hargraves, the movement aims to, quote, bring Christian values back into British political life, unquote, as well as to forge a valuable link with other Christian parties on the European mainland, such as those in Italy, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland and Austria, together with their new counterparts in Hungary, Poland and Czechoslovakia, unquote as you can read in the Catholic Herald, 10th of August, 1990. There is little doubt, there is little doubt, but that the solid post-war success of the Christian democratic parties in Europe has convinced the Vatican that social democracy with a Christian label is the way forward, especially after the spectacular failure, failure of communism. The Jesuits, using Catholic action and other forms of political activity and pressure, have played the key role in bringing about these successes in Western Europe and are poised to do the same in the East. The Pope has specifically called on the Society of Jesus to train priests for Eastern Europe to give the Roman Catholic Church what the European described as, quote, a leading role in the political reform of Eastern Europe." Unquote. Time magazine reported in the same month that Jesuit experts met in Rome in mid-December 1990 to plan this job. The Jesuits, currently training 1.8 million students in colleges and schools throughout the world, are regarded as the intellectual elite who educate the cream of Catholic society as well as being the largest missionary body in the Catholic Church. A quote from Time magazine, 10th of December 1990. Another strategy, another ideology. Different means, same ends. Whereas Christian democracy had brought many dividends to the Vatican in Europe, the strategy for Central America implemented by the Jesuits has been more reliant on Marxism and liberation theology. The Denver, Colorado-based organization Concerned Christians drew attention to Jesuit activities in Latin American countries in 1989. Quote, 
Jesuits occupy high positions in the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, despite its Marxist leanings, unquote, reported the magazine US News and World Report. Others, having set up a network of work, worker priests, are deeply involved in revolutionary movements in El Salvador, Guatemala, Brazil and elsewhere. They play a key role in the major theological offensive which is bringing Marxism and Roman Catholicism together under the banner of liberation theology. The Pope described liberation theology as, quote, not only orthodox but necessary when purified of elements which can ad uh, adulterate it, unquote. It is widely seen by watchful Christians as what Jesuit-educated Marxist Fidel Castro had called for at the end of the 1970s. Quote, a strategic alliance between religion and socialism, between religion and revolution. Unquote. Castro's durability may be seen now as owing more to the Vatican than the Kremlin. To religion more than revolution or socialism. Fidel Castro was Jesuit educated. The last part of this chapter is called The Church Militant. Cardinal Manning Leader of Catholicism in England at the end of the 19th century and a staunch supporter of papal infallibility in 1870, spoke to the Jesuit fathers in stirring fashion, calling them to battle and unmistakably laying out the strategy and plan of attack for the coming 20th century. Quote, Great is the price for which you strive. Surely a soldier's eye and a soldier's heart would choose by intuition this field of England. None ampler nor or nobler could be found. It is an head of Protestantism, the centre of its movements and the stronghold of its power. Weakened in England, it is paralysed elsewhere. Conquered in England, it is conquered throughout all the world. Once overthrown here, all else is but a war of detail. All the roads of the world meet in one point, and this point reached, all the world is open to the Church's will." Unquote. From Life of Cardinal Manning by Edward Sheridan Purcell Well, the Bible gives us a very clear warning of that. When you read in Acts chapter 20 verse 29, quote, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. CRIB has also warned of the church to be vigilant. You remember CRIB stands for Catholic Research Information Bureau, yeah? has also warned the Church to be vigilant. Quote, Jesuits, or at least those with Jesuit training, for the first time in our history are in the most influential leadership roles, as religious broadcasters, as chaplains in Britain's top schools and educational establishments, and as speakers, teachers and organizers among the leading parachurch organizations. Their sincerity and the courage of their convictions in relation to their cause is not to be questioned. This is the very thing that makes the situation so dangerous and why it is vital that the watchmen sound the alarm. The aim of the papacy and its secret army is, as it is always has been, to gain world domination and every human subject to it. The ecumenical movement was not founded on the free evangelical message of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but was spawned in the dark corridors of the Vatican by the Jesuit General Bia. This movement is the latest expression of that system, spoken of in Scripture, which will be destroyed according to the fulfillment of God's will in Revelation 17, 
verses 16, 17, and 18. The scriptures carefully and repeatedly warn us of the deception in our midst. From Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, we read, False brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And from Second Corinthians, ending the chapter here, chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, quote, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing that if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Unquote. This was a very interesting and intense chapter 12 to read, to study, and to follow on. According to Jesuit trained what's the guy's name again? Um, oh, yeah. Um, wait a second. Voltaire. Well, sometimes I just don't count to the names. According to Jesuit trained Mr. Voltaire there were more than 6,000 books written on the Jesuits in the 18th century available. And today you can find almost nothing that deals with the whole history of the Jesuits from their founding through the 16th and 17th century anymore. We have been robbed of our culture, we have been robbed of our history, we have been put into a matrix system that the Jesuits want to play for us. And we have only one possibility to find the way out of that maze. And that is when we find and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. The author Michael de Semnian writes this book and says, All roads lead to Rome? Question mark. Yeah, all roads lead to Rome. And all roads that lead to Rome lead into perdition. And it is up to you to find the only way. Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. It is up to you to accept him and to follow his road. Or you will follow the road to Rome. Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Signing off. Until next time. Bye bye. We, as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these. Um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 there will be wars, wars and rumors of wars and we know that the Antichrist by peace will destroy many and so on and so on and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You, as Bible-believing Christians, already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. 
because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there, pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of, and that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance. By going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.